continuing to walk through the book of Philippians. And uh, there's so much that God has to say through us through this book and so much that we've already been challenged with um, encouragement and a call to joy, a call to, to enjoy, embrace the, the love of Christ. And um, I tell you, every time I get, <laughs> I get up, it's just it's interesting. We've got fear and trembling in this text. Because every time I get up before you, uh, it's with fear and trembling, just desiring to, to lay out the word accurately and rightly in a way that challenges you and encourages you. And um, I say that because I think so often when we open the word, it's easy to hear a lot of do's and do's and do's and do's and do's and don'ts and don'ts and don'ts. And we can be discouraged by that. We can hear it as a list of things to do and not to do, and, and we can become um, maybe paralyzed, discouraged, uh, wondering if we can ever do this. And, uh, and in this section that we're looking at, we're not looking at the whole section, but this, this section of 12 through 18 that we'll be looking at over the next several weeks, we may do something a little different in the next couple of weeks, but um, Paul gives us a list of commands, things that we are to do. And for legalists or recovering legalists like me, these are parts of scriptures that we tend to dislike a little bit. When we hear, do this, and do this, and do this. Um, and then on the other hand, there's some people who just love lists. It's like, you just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. So you give me lists, and I'll, I'll do that. You tell me to love somebody, I'll do that. You tell me to go and do that, I'll do that. So we kind of run the gamut here. And I know that there are some of each of those categories sitting amongst me. Most of the ones are people with smiles on their faces, because I just called your name out without calling your name out. But either way, I want us to understand what Paul is saying here and what the New Testament is assuming when we are told to do or to act or to accomplish something. So take a breath. Don't get excited. Don't get frustrated. Don't get a little antsy because we're talking about things to do because there are commands but we are also going to make sure that we see that equally there are reassurances. There are encouragements along the way. And I think whenever fallen mankind is given a list of requirements, it's nearly always discouraging because we understand that we're most likely to fail. Or if we're being more honest, we know that we are probably, we're going to fail. We're, we're not going to do this rightly. So we need to understand God's provision at the same time that we look at his requirements because it is his provision that makes his requirement possible. So that's a hint as to where we're going. That's what we're going to be looking at a lot today. So we want to look carefully and honestly at how we do these things, how we accomplish what God has said is a requirement for us. And today we're focusing on what I think is one of the more challenging instructions or things that he says to us to understand, but it is, I believe, the key for us getting any of it right. For any of the lists that we get, any of the do's that we're supposed to do, even the don'ts that we're not supposed to do, it is key for us to understand this. And it's in 12, verses 12 and 13, where he says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you've also obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So as we open this particular section, these two verses up a little bit, I want us to look at this in more detail, see if we can take a journey through this that will get us to a place of understanding and encouragement. And so he starts off, therefore, my dear friends. So what follows here in 12 and 13 and, and, and the preceding verses out of it here, what follows precedes from the previous thought. So when he says, therefore, we ask the question, what's it there for? What, what was before that that gives us a clue into understanding what is to follow? And so he says then, uh, it's really, I think, two parts. So uh, overall, I think we can go back to verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 27, 
And all of this still flows out of verse 27, where he says, just one thing, as citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Because that's that big, that big, I mean, that's a call that we've already looked at and said, how do we do that? And then over the last couple of weeks, he's unpacked some of that. And so I think this still follows that. Live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But then, of course, it goes back more immediately, I believe, to adopt the same attitude as that of who is in Christ. I'm sorry, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And then he goes into that song of worship there of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished. So we have to look at it in light of that. So obedience is a predetermination that Jesus had, if we look at that. Jesus was determined to obey the Father, and obedience to the Father defines who Jesus was while he was on this earth, even to the point of death. It's like obedience to the max, because he said even death on a cross, which is the worst of the worst. So that, that outlines the kind and the depth of, of obedience that Jesus had, the quality of obedience. And we are to have the same attitude that Christ had. How could we possibly diminish the importance of obedience in our own lives when we're told to adopt the same attitude Jesus had? I don't think we do this generally, but I think we have to be careful not to ever think the call to obedience is any way a form of legalism. I think we can easily slip into that, but we have to really be careful of that because Christ determined to obey out of love for the Father. He didn't obey because, oh, I have to. I don't want to do this. Why did he send me on this mission? Why am I here? It was out of love for the Father. He wanted to obey. And if we love Jesus, there's going to be an inherent desire to obey Jesus, to follow after him, even if we don't feel that we always have the will or the means to obey. Because sometimes we can feel that way. You feel like, you know what, I want to, but my want to isn't enough. I just don't feel like I can. If we love Christ and we desire to become like Christ, a life of obedience in some form and some way, to some extent where we are as we have been given a measure of faith, is the expression of it. There's just no other way. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. And so notice what Jesus was saying here is do what I tell you to do. Keeping his requirements or his commandments requires some type, some level of work, some level of effort that we put into this. It doesn't just all come. There's more to it. It is deeper than this. So Paul says essentially, My friends, as you've always worked to obey, keep doing it, especially since I'm not there. And and I think we could could say, Paul might be implying too, and I might not be there. In light of the fact that I'm not with you, do this all the more as you always have obeyed. He wasn't saying they did it perfectly. He's not calling that we do it perfectly or not at all. Instead, he was saying do it because of your love for Christ, understanding that there are things that, that you're going to do improperly. You're going to do things uh, not fully. Uh, even with the people in Philippi, there were things that, that Paul had to correct. Uh, they struggled with some level of un- uh, disunity. And so he spoke that. He called that out. Yet they were still known for their obedience. And so as we look at what he says here, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work according to his good purpose. There are two inseparable essential parts in these verses, and both are related to the word work. So the first one is work out your own salvation in 12, and in 13 it is is God who is at work. And so we have to see how these words and how they interconnect. How is one a result of, or how is it connected to the second part? And the importance lies in how this word is used in each of those verses. So starting from the beginning, here's what we know. Paul says you must work, you must do. And so we have to acknowledge in the New Testament that's what we're called to, that's what we're told. Can't get away from the fact 
that we're to obediently do some things by playing the grace card, right? Because, oh, because of grace, I'm perfected in Christ, therefore, I just let it flow. I, all is good, all is clear, I'm good until Jesus comes back or until he calls me home. We can't do that, there is more. Instead, we're going to have to figure out how grace makes work possible. So let's dive in here and see what we're talking about. So on the one hand, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And before we get any further, I want us to look at this kind of at face value. What is Paul literally saying? And, and if we look at this, we look in kind of the words that are used here, and we, we talk about work out. The word that is used here, it, it means to do, to bring about, to produce, to accomplish with sustained strenuous effort. So to accomplish, to bring something about. And then he talks about salvation. Work out your own salvation, which is, we kind of know that, the state of being delivered or preserved from harm, specifically talking about heaven. So we take that together at face value. We have something like this. Bring about, produce, or accomplish with sustained, strenuous effort a state of being delivered or preserved. All right, so think about that for a second. Bring about, bring about, produce, or accomplish through st strenuous effort a state of being delivered or preserved. Now, that's problematic. And at face value, that's, that's problematic if that's what Paul is saying. How do I do that? How do I, through work and strenuous effort, bring about salvation? The simple answer is, I can't. I can't do that. So that means there are two things that are, are certain here. That's two things that are at work here. Number one, Paul says, to produce or accomplish salvation with sustained strenuous effort. And number two is, I can't produce or accomplish salvation regardless of my strenuous effort. Those two things are, are clear there. So what, what does it mean? So I, I think there has to be something else. There must be another meaning or some kind of nuance because Scripture clearly teaches against works-based salvation. So if you have had this mentality that if you're good enough or you do things right enough that you will get some level of salvation, that because you're basically a good person, God's going to say, come on in, I could use some basically good people up here. But that's not true. That's not what Scripture calls. He says there must be perfection and holiness. And how do we do that? There's a prepositional phrase here that follows that I think is important. I think it gives us a clue as to how to understand this. He says, with fear and trembling. What does that mean? What are we talking about? He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I think this is a clue to how to interpret the, how to interpret the first part. So we've got two words here, fear and trembling. Let's take the first one, the second one first, trembling. It means to tremble. I think we got that one, right? It's, it's uh, you know, where there's just anxiety or there's some sort of trembling going on. It's pretty straightforward. But fear, I think, is a little more nuanced, a little more challenging. It's a, little, a bit more complex because there are different kinds of fear. And so interesting, the use of fear that Paul is talking about here is a feeling of profound respect for someone or something, often a deity conceived of as fear. And I think we could use the words amazement or awe. This is the usage of what Paul, work out your salvation, your own salvation, with fear and trembling, with this amazement or awe. And I think that's telling because we're not talking about the kind of fear that's produced or created if I'm told that I have to accomplish my own salvation. At that point, we're talking about hopeless horror, right? That's, that's where I'm, I'm afraid because I know I can't do this. So there's, there's that hopelessness that would, co would come with that kind of fear, but that's not what Paul is saying. This one is a profound respect for a deity, for God, and so if you couple the two, we have a respect so profound that when we think about it, it causes trembling or amazement and awe. And what are we thinking about? We're thinking about the first part coupled with the second. I want you to think about this. 
If I'm told to accomplish my own salvation through strenuous work, and I come to the realization which I can't, which I will come to the realization that I can't as soon as I start trying, then there's only one thing that can cause that kind of awestruck amazement to the point of trembling. And that is to know that God does what I cannot do, and he has done what I cannot do. Notice verse 13 starts with the word for. That's to say, accomplish or produce your salvation with such profound respect that it causes you to tremble for, or because, or maybe when you realize that God is doing it. Have that kind of attitude where you're working this out with fear and trembling because you realize, for you realize that God is doing this. And that's the second part. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. And that's what makes all the difference. That truth is meant to fuel Paul's instruction to work out your own salvation, but it doesn't just fuel it, it defines it. It tells us what it is. So if working out my own salvation cannot mean to accomplish my own salvation through sustained, strenuous work because, number one, I'm not able to, and number two, God has already accomplished it, then what must it mean? I believe that it must mean that I am called to obediently work out the effect of my salvation that I have been given with sustained, strenuous effort because it is God empowering my sustained, strenuous effort. In other words, it is to say, it is my will, but it is God's power to allow me to discover and apply all that God has given to me. It is a sense of discovery. It is a sense of pursuing and growing in all that God is implanted and working and growing in me. So we have to see how grace and action work together so that we're neither legalists nor lawless. So that we're not burdened by rules and laws, but we don't take the approach that because I'm complete in Christ, I am not saved by works and there is nothing that I must do to cultivate my relationship with Christ and accomplish for the kingdom. I can't go to that extreme. And I think that few of us really believe that. We don't hold on to that, but I think that we can recoil when we hear these words and we automatically throw up the defenses because we felt saddled by this works righteousness talk. And so when we hear somebody who says, we've got to work out this, we've got to work at this, you've got to do something, we can recoil saying, that's just more stuff that I have, I'm burdened with in order that I have to do this. And that's not, that's not at all what Paul is saying. It's a liberating thing that he tells us that it is God working in you to do and to will according to his good purposes. J. Alec Moyer helps clarify by explaining that salvation is given to us by Christ. But he says, the care of the individual soul, the everyday kind of care of the individual soul belongs to that individual. Responsibility for personal spiritual growth is committed to the person. Not at this point, not at this point, a work of God nor a work of fellowship, but of a work of individual responsibility, laying hold of grace, that's important, laying hold of grace, rejoicing in the benefits of fellowship, my responsibility for me. Now, listen carefully to the second part to try to help you understand that first part. So he says this, your own salvation is to be understood not as an objective to be reached, not something you do on your own, so certainly not as a benefit to be merited, but as a possession to be explored and enjoyed ever more fully. The proper model is the counsel to a newly married couple to work out your marriage. For marriage once possessed is possessed in full, but merits a lifetime of exploration, enjoyment, development, and discovery. It's like being a, a, a spouse. It's being in a marriage or being the parent of children. You have your children. That doesn't change, but you grow in how to nurture your children, how to raise your children. It takes great work. If you're married, enough said. Right? You know that. It takes work. We, use, we say that all the time. You're not, a, you're not trying to attain. Now, some of you had to work really, really hard to get into marriage. I get that because she kept saying no, and so finally you, she relented. 
And I get that, and I understand why in some of your cases. Nevertheless, that is not the case. It is once you are in that, it takes great work in order to, to grow it and enhance it and to understand it and to, to pull back all the layers. And it takes a whole lifetime of learning your partner and growing in that love relationship. This is what the kind of love that we're talking about. This is the kind of work that we're talking about. And so there's this truth. What we are to do or strive to be is reliant upon what is already true of us if we are in Christ, what has already been done for us, and that makes all the difference. We are doing what has already been done for us. Moyer says again, by statement or implication, he's talking about this whole section of 12 through 18. <clears throat> by statement or implication, the directives in 12 through 18 are to obey to work, we get in verse 12. To do, we get in verse 14. To be blameless. To shine, verse 15. And then to hold fast in verse 16. But there are reassurances that are interspersed with that. So we get in verse 13 that God is at work. We get in 15 that you are God's children and you are lights. And so Moyer goes on to say the Christian life growing in the likeness of Christ is a blend of rest and activities, not Uh, alternating from one to the other, but a blend in which at one and the same moment, the Christian is both resting confidently and actively pursuing, just like in marriage or a family. You don't just do work and then you go, ah, we're having a great time. There's this inner, this blending of it all where you are in life together and it's you're both resting and working at the same time. Sometimes it's more defined one way or the other, but there's this inner mix and this movement in and out of working and enjoying and reassured and blessed and all of these things that make up your life in marriage or in parenting. So what does this working out look like? What are we talking about when he says work out? I turn to John Piper who explains, I think, this concept well by saying the salvation that we are to work out is not just the large reality of deliverance someday, but the concrete reality of salvation from everyday sinning. Okay, this is where the rubber meets the road, man. This is, this is where we live, ground level here. I have to use the word ground level because if any of you all read, um, uh, what's his name? Ricky, what'd you call me that while I go with my, I, you drew a blank. Paul David Tripp, that's, that's his thing here at ground level, street level. So I'm trying to be my Paul David Tripp, show a little wisdom in my style here. So he says, uh, so everyday sinning, this is to bring about the deliverance from daily sinning. So this is to say, his work enables my will to strenuously attack sin in my life. And this is what guarantees success. We get so frustrated, we get so disheartened when it just feels like as I attack sin, it just attacks back and I get wiped out. So how do we do this? We have to understand that his work enables my will. So we talked about fear and trembling. Piper looks back at, at those words again and he sees a connection between that, between fear and trembling and then God's presence working and willing in me. So why fear and trembling? And if we're, we're wanting the answer of why should we attack sins with fear and trembling. And so Piper says this, the ground for this fear is not threat, but gift. God is in you, willing and working. Your acting is his acting in that we don't wait for a miracle, we act the miracle. My attack on my sin in reliance on the Holy Spirit rooted in the gospel is God's act not mine. If we get that, we tremble. My willing is that willing of Almighty God. My acting is the action of omnipotent God. He's that close to me working on my behalf. And if you can get your mind around that, it can lead you to fear and trembling of just the amazement that he actually loves you that much, that he is that close to you, that he cares that much for you. That he doesn't say, do this, and then leave you back away and say, all right, let's see how you do, pal. Let's say, you say you love me, bring it on. Let's see, give me some results. Instead, he says, work out your salvation. I will work in you to produce it, to make the growth happen. It's God working in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. How amazing is that? 
Is it not every other deity in the world that people follow where it's always, I'm trying to please this God and then in fear and trembling, I'm afraid that I'm not gonna get it right and so they're gonna squash me? It's a total 180. It's totally different. It's totally opposite. We're looking at the very reverse of that where God says, I love you so much. I'm there. I've got you. I'm doing this. You work strenuously. You get at it because I'm enabling it to happen in you. Man, that's praiseworthy right there. Thank you. That's right. We just take a big old deep breath. All the legalists in in the house ought to be saying amen. (laughs) He goes on to say then that my work is, is in effect sin killing. I'm called to holiness. How does that happen? I intentionally and relentlessly attack and kill everyday sin in my life every day. And that's my thing, man. It's like I'm attacking it. I'm attacking it with a passion. I'm not letting sin reign in my body. And and this is important because I know we're here and we are all sinners. And I know we all give in to that sin that we don't want to give in to. It always comes at us and we're like, I don't want to do that. Oh, I just did that because I wanted to do that. But I didn't want to do that. I mean, it's like we're schizophrenic, right? It's like, how do we work through this? And we have to understand that every day I must intentionally and relentlessly attack it and kill it in my life through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's ask the question and answer it. How do I successfully attack sin in my life? And the first thing is I must realize that Christ has already forgiven and canceled my sin. That's important. If you don't get that one, you don't understand that one, you don't get anywhere else. Because you're still trying to fight against sin that is not dealt with already. And it's like you're trying to deal with it in your own power and you're not going to. But it's imperative to understand that Christ has already forgiven and canceled my sin so I can fight against it. I can only attack and eliminate sin that has already been defeated. So this truth is imperative for the power perspective towards sin. It is powerless over me because of the cross of Christ. Therefore, I can begin the process of removing it from my life because it has no power. It's like these things that attach themselves to me and then they're killed, but they're still like lurching on and there's still something kind of sucking. I gotta get it out of there. I gotta work that out. But I can do that if I understand that Christ has already canceled it. I don't deal with the, with the, with the, with the, uh, the, the fact that I'm still under the weight of that. I'm delivered from that. I don't have the guilt of that anymore, even though I can feel that. The guilt has been removed. And so it's like all that's left is to attack it and to fight it off and to fend it off through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't miss that last phrase. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So secondly, I attack it with what Piper calls an empowered will. An empowered will. If I'm just, if it's just my will, (laughs) my willpower is pretty weak. I gotta be honest with you. Sugar, Yeah, man, it's hard for me to say no to sugar and to sweets and to desserts. Broccoli, I'm okay with. Anything sweet, a bit of a struggle. Don't always say no to that. And so if it's my will, I'm in problem. I'm I'm in trouble. But if it's an empowered will, that's a different thing. So we are commanded to do. And the connection between my conquering sin and the power to do so is the Holy Spirit empowered will based on the cross of Christ. It is a Holy Spirit willing of sin killing. There's my poem. Romans 6. Let me give you just a couple of passages here. Romans 6. His work enables my will to strenuously attack my life with guaranteed success. Uh, That is not the verse. Let me turn to the verse real quick. That was a point. Ah, there it is. Verse 6. Now we have been released from the law. So there it is. We have been released from the law since We have died to what held us so that what we may serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the old letter of the law. I have been released. Romans 8, the next chapter, verses 12 and 13. So then, brothers and sisters, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh because if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's an important passage in what we're talking about. You're not obligated to to the sin. And I think sometimes we feel like we are. It's like, well, I'm just human. I'm only human. 
But in Christ, you are more than human. In Christ, you have the power of the Spirit of God that says you're no longer indebted to that. You are no longer uh, obligated to the flesh to live according to it because you live according to the flesh. You're going to die, but if by the Spirit you put it to death, you kill it, then you will live. Galatians 2.20, one of my favorites. I use this a lot because it's important. I think that we go through this every day. I've been crucified with Christ. I'm dead. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. There's the power. And then finally, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. By the grace of God, I am what I am, Paul is arguing, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of the other apostles he's talking about. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Yet not I, but the grace of God. Of God. It was, so he said, I worked harder than anybody else, but not I. It was the grace of God in me. You can say, look, I'll, I'll work harder than anybody else, but not I. It's the power of the Spirit of God within me. The link is clear. In each of these verses, in every case, I'm doing it. But in every case, my will is empowered by a Holy Spirit gift so that he gets the glory. So if I'm going to kill sin in my life, I have to acknowledge these truths if I am in Christ. I need to know these things. Number one, sin has been canceled and has no power over me. I've already said it. I just want to put it in kind of a list form so you can remember. it. Sin has been canceled and has no power over me. I have to know that. I have to write that down. I have to, to lock it down and remember all the time because the, the one thing, the main thing that Satan is going to bring to you is you are such a sinner. That is the attack. Is it not? I mean, am I, I'm talking, you know, practical stuff, man. It's like I, when I'm under attack, it is you're a loser, Price. You're a sinner. There's no way he could love you. There's no way you could be saved. Are you kidding? Not the way you are. Not the way you think, you act, you talk. That's the attack. So I have to know in my head, in my mind, I have to resolve in my heart, it has been canceled. That's what Martin Luther said. Hey, what of it? I've got, I've got Christ. I plead the blood of Christ. Amen. Thank you. It's not me, is it? <laughs> blood of Jesus. Sin still, secondly, sin still tries to conquer me. Sin has been canceled. It has no power over me, but sin still tries to conquer me. James 1.14. Each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desires. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. You need to see that. Sin, sin still tries to conquer me. It's obviously I'm being drawn away and enticed by evil desires. Then when desire has conceived. So it's at that point of the, the desire begins to grow in me. And then when it is conceived, then it gives birth, birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. So sin has been canceled. It has no power over me. Sin, sin still tries to conquer me. And then thirdly, sin can only remain present as I allow it to. If these other things are true, then sin can only remain in my life if I allow it to. Stay in James here. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. James says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? You desire and you do not have. You murder and you covet and you cannot obtain. You fight and you wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Verse four, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the friend of the world becomes the enemy of God. Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely? In verse six, here we go. But he gives greater grace. All that stuff is true. But he gives greater grace. That is so important to remember. Because I sometimes wonder, God, is your power enough? Is your strength enough? Because my failure makes me feel as though it's not. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, because of that, because of the fact that God gives greater grace, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will 
flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, resist the devil. When you have those attacks, resist the devil. Submit to God. Cleanse your hands. What's he talking about? Confession. Lord, I am not strong enough. I am not enough. I know that I have sinned. I know that I will sin. I submit myself to you. I purify myself by running away from that, and I uh, stick close to you. Because the truth is, most sin is not instantaneous. You begin to feel the temptation. I mean, it's possible, I guess, that something comes on you, and it's just like, without a thought, you're just like in it. But most of the time, that's not the case. Most of the time in my life, I feel the temptation beginning to come. I feel myself kind of drawing away. I feel myself taking my eyes off of Christ, and I'm starting to look at the thing that feeds whatever that appetite is that's in me, because we all have those appetites. So what is it? You can fill in the blank on what your appetite is, but I feel that starting to happen, that sin that tends to get me almost every time. And so it's not just like I go, oh, I'm in it. It's like, hmm, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good over there, right? So we start to drift over in the direction. And I think that's key. I think it's important that that's the moment where we must begin to take all of this and to put it into action. We have to, at that point, begin to fight, to redirect to what is good and holy. Because if all of this that we've set up to now is true, then I don't have to keep going in this direction then I have the ability because of the Holy Spirit within me to move back. And I think that's the key. What do we believe about God? What do we believe about the Spirit in us? What do we believe about the power that we have? Do I have to continue falling? The Word of God says, no, I don't. Begin to go back, turn your affections back towards Christ. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, that's later in this book, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Now, dwell on these things prior to entering into temptation. That should be the source of our meditation, these things. But if I start to feel myself drift, drifting, I gotta start, I gotta, you know, pull out the big guns and start going back to what is true and right and good and holy. So I would encourage you, three kind of practical things. Pick up the word. Pick up the word. If you are feeling temptation, pick up the word. I have found it hard to sin while reading scripture. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible that my thoughts can't wander and all of that, but I can tell you it is more challenging while I'm reading scripture to go do that thing that's pulling me away than when I'm not. And so I, I, let me expand that. I need to regularly be thinking on these things. So a regular appetite, a regular diet of getting the word in, in the morning, in the afternoon, whenever, wherever. You've got it on your phone, man. Spend time dwelling on the word of God. It is a tool, a weapon. It is called the sword of the spirit. Why? So I can fend off all these things. So pick up the word. But there are other things that God has given us too. Pick up the phone, right? Do you have people in your life who you know that if you pick up the phone and you call them and you say, hey, I'm struggling with that thing again, which implies that you have told them that you're struggling with that thing, but that's what godly fellowship is. That's what being a part of the family is. Do you have people you can pick up the phone and say, hey, man, I'm struggling right now. Can you get me out of this? Can you talk me off the ledge? Remind me of what is true and right and good. Remind me, pray with me right now, would you? So pick up the word, pick up the phone. And then the third thing that I throw in, a lot of people don't, pick up the journal. Sometimes that's very helpful to me. When I open up my journal and I start writing what I'm struggling with, or I'm writing truths, I'm writing out prayers, whatever it is, then I'm diverting my mind from what the temptation is where it's leading me to bringing it centered. Pick up the word, pick up the, friend, pick up the phone, and pick up your journal. If you don't have one, get one. I'm gonna write it out so that you can see what God is doing in your life. So why is it like this? Why do we have to fight so hard to work out our salvation? Why isn't it that when God saves us, he just stops it? <laughs> he just ends it. I, I'm, I vote for that. I mean, not, I, I would like that. So Lord, no, not up to me. 
but we have to, well, I don't know why we have to struggle. And I, just, I really don't. At the end of the day, I don't know, since God could certainly do that. What I do know is that Paul says that it is according to his good purpose. It is according to his good purpose. It is the intentional plan of God for us to go about it this way. He wants us to learn and grow in his power through the struggle. But that the glory is because it is God at work within us to do and to work according to his good purpose. He has a purpose in making a struggle. He has a purpose in and make, I don't know if it's sort of like the butterfly we talk about before where you've got a caterpillar goes to the cocoon and the butterfly, when it comes out, it has to really struggle. It's like fighting to get out of that thing. You just wonder, why can't you just open it up? But I've been told, I'm not so cruel as to try this, but I've been told that if you were to go up and open up a cocoon and let the butterfly out, it'll never fly because it's the struggle that is making it fly. I don't know if that's just a part of the process that God is making us to be more like Jesus and preparing us for heaven. Whatever it is, I know it is. It is God's good purpose. He has a plan, a purpose for this, and it is good. So engage the fight. Engage the battle with the confidence that you can over, overcome. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God's at work in you. To work, he does the work. And to will, he empowers your will according to his good purpose. Let's pray.